Minister's Question Time. Following that, about books. This week's program looks at the National Book Awards. Then, the Sara Lee Frontrunner Awards Dinner. Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor is among this year's honorees. Now, from San Francisco, the oral arguments in the case of Rand v. Rowland from the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. At issue is whether a California state prisoner's constitutional rights were violated when he was segregated at a prison infirmary after being diagnosed with the AIDS virus. The debate runs about an hour, 15 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're hearing three in-bank cases. As I announced that our first in-bank case, uh, we're dedicating this day to the memory of Judge Cecil Poole, who passed away last week. Uh, we will, at a later date, uh, be having a formal memorial service in his honor, but I'd like to take this occasion to pay our respects to a distinguished colleague. He was a skilled United States attorney, and in the 1960s, he was selected by Time Magazine as Man of the Year. He was later became, later became a distinguished district judge, and thereafter, a well-respected member of our court. He served with wisdom, integrity, and compassion, and we'll all remember his delightful sense of humor. We'll miss him a great deal. We'll now hear uh, this, this case. <clears throat> which is, uh, we'll hear first from the appellant. Good morning. Amy Margolin for Appellant Lee Rand. I'd like to reserve four minutes for, of rebuttal time, please. May it please the court. The issue in this case is one of sound judicial administration whether or not a particular class of litigants, pro se inmates, can expect the adversary process to function properly and fairly on summary judgment. Fair notice rule has been the law of this circuit for many years and it's currently recognized in five other jurisdictions. Now this court is faced with the question of whether and to what extent it ought to remain the law of this circuit. The rule is announced by the panel and applied in this case. It's well grounded in interest of judicial economy fairness, and it's also consistent with the mandate of the federal rules of civil procedure. Given the reasons for the fair notice rule that have been recognized by the courts, the issue here is a very narrow one. Was Mr. Rand given adequate notice of the nature and the consequences of the defendant's dispositive summary judgment motion? Based on the record, the answer in this case is clearly no. I'd like to remind the court of how we came to this juncture. In this case, the defendants moved for summary judgment. It's an action involving constitutional claims of serious, uh, alleging serious constitutional injuries. Uh, the court needs no reminder, my client was confined for, for six months in a state of near quarantine uh, because of his HIV positive status uh, in the Tehachapi State Prison. Uh, he was never let out of his cell other than to take an occasional shower uh, or make an occasional phone call. For six months, he languished indefinitely uh, in the infirmary in the Tehachapi State Prison. He, he raised a number of constitutional claims under the Eighth Amendment, First Amendment, and otherwise. Uh, and the defendants ultimately moved for summary judgment. In the first two pages of the defendant's motion, there was a very vague and, and long and rambling explanation of the shifting burdens of proof on summary judgment. You're referring to the uh, material entitled Notice of Rules Relating to Summary Judgment? 
That's right, Your Honor. Pursuant to Klingley versus Eikenberry? That's right. Counsel, why? It's, it seems to me that the inmate has a law library. He can read Rule 56 in the law library. I don't see why giving him some boilerplate form from the clerk of the district court, which is what Klingley means, educates him any better than the words of Rule 56. Uh, the words of Rule 56 seem about as clear to me as any form that the clerk's office is likely to write up. Well, Your Honor, a number of circuits that have addressed this question have... have we, we've read your briefs and the authorities. That's right. Uh, uh, actually, I don't think any circuit but ours has made it a matter of structural error requiring reversal, uh, even if the uh, plaintiff knew about the rule and uh, was advised of it by opposing counsel, and even if there was no prejudice. Well, but, Your Honor, but that, that's a different question. The, the question of prejudice is a separate question, and essentially there, there, are three, there are three questions here. The first is the question of whether the notice ought to come from the district court or the I, moving party. I want to know why a boilerplate form from the district court as opposed to the fairly lucid text of Rule 56 is required by law. The, for several reasons, Your Honor. First of all, the, uh, the text of Rule 56, I don't believe, is, 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 is expressly states uh, that the failure to, to submit responsive evidence could mean that your case is going to be disposed Doesn't it say that expressly? Doesn't it say that if the uh, party against whom the motion is made doesn't demonstrate that there's a genuine issue of fact or that he's entitled to judgment as a matter of law, judgment shall be entered against him. Isn't that the words? It, it does state that, Your Honor. However, the situation of a, of a pro se prisoner inmate is such that they can't necessarily be expected to understand that that kind of legalese is, uh, that that kind of legalese means that their case is going to be decided short of trial. Well, and the average clerk of court is a better legal educator? Well, the question, Your Honor, of whether the uh, the clerk of the court ought to give the text of Rule 56 to a prisoner is not the issue here. The question is whether whether the court ought to give something more than that, and 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 it's our position that the court ought to, because the text of Rule 56 does not state affirmatively that the that the moving part uh, pardon me that the non-moving party is obligated to respond by way of counter evidence, or else the moving party's evidence will be accepted as true. That appears nowhere in the text of Rule 56. It must be inferred, if anything. Secondly, Actually, there are quite a few things that don't appear in the text, like our Ratobenko rule about non-genuine issues of fact. How far does a clerk have to go in this education? Your Honor, it, it, it boils down to this. There, there are three elements of fair notice that ought to be given. First, a notice that if the, that if the, uh, pardon me, the non-moving party fails to read submit evidence to counter the non-moving party's evidence, then that evidence will be accepted by the court as true. That appears nowhere in the rule of, uh, in the text of Rule 56. Secondly, the litigant ought to be advised in plain understandable English, rather than legalese, that a summary judgment motion is a potentially dispositive motion, and if they fail to adequately respond, they could lose their right to trial. The text of Rule 56 doesn't speak to the issue of losing one's right to trial. Now, it's true an, an inmate who's confined has some limited access to a law library, but in reality, this, the question of whether or not any particular inmate's going to have the resources and wherewithal to divine the meaning of the summary judgment rule by spending by getting to the law library in the prison in the first place and figuring it out on their own, uh, it's very questionable. And for that reason, the courts have, have, uh, have fashioned the fair notice rule. What do you mean by, you keep using the word legalese. What do you mean by that? Your Honor, the, the, I mean it in the sense that the moving parties, two pages of so-called notice that they gave was, was little more than a, sort of a discourse on the shifting burdens of proof. Have what you it, ever tried to draft one? I mean, what would you say? If you don't respond, you'll lose? Is that clear? That is very clear, Your Honor. In fact, that's, that is what, what some district courts in other jurisdictions do. And, and, uh, and I would call the court's attention, for example, to the Heights 
decision. It's a decision we cited in our briefs, a district court opinion. Uh, and the, in the appendix to that decision, the Heights case, there is a, there's an example of what kind of notice the district court gave. If, in that if, case gave. If, if you say, well, if you don't respond with statements of fact that are under oath, you lose. Then in order to make that meaningful in non-legalese, wouldn't you have to say, if you don't submit statements of fact that are competent and aren't hearsay, that is, aren't statements by somebody made out of court for the truth, of, for the truth that you'll lose. I don't believe that, that the court... You have to do that. I don't believe so, Your Honor. And the reason be is because in the text of Rule 50... Because you will lose if you don't do that. Well, I don't mean to suggest that, 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 that the litigant ought not to be warned that, of, about the possibility of losing the right to go to trial. That is a very critical piece of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the information that the applicant is given. However, uh, it's not... It, I don't believe it's necessary that the court then go on to explain the rules of evidence, for example. It's sufficient... Most, most lay people have an intuitive idea of not perhaps the rules of evidence themselves, but have an intuitive understanding of, of the fact of that evidentiary rules exist. And for that reason, they don't need to have long explanations about evidence. Is there something evidence. unusual about the concept of courts being required to explain to parties what their rights are? In, or even police officers being required to devise a form to explain to parties what their rights are. It, do you think this is some kind of problem that district courts are incapable of solving in a fairly easy way? I don't, Your Honor. And in fact, the record in this case shows two instances where the court did advise uh, my client of some uh, of, of technical procedures in the, in, the, in the process. One was the pretrial statement, the pretrial <coughs> conference order that the, that the court uh, filed notifying the parties of the trial date. And in that, and in that uh, document, the, the court did set forth a, a very clear, understandable explanation of, of, of my client's obligation to present evidence at trial and the difference between and just and essentially stated that there were two kinds of evidence, documentary evidence and, and, and witness evidence, uh, pardon me, testimony. Uh, and then the second place in the record where the court did that was when, when the court uh, uh, found that the, the complaint was not frivolous in order that the, uh, the complaint be served. At that point, the court uh, gave my client some rudimentary explanation of the need to serve and file his papers and how to do that. So it's not an impossible task for the district courts to come up with some clear language. That, that, would, see, that would lead me to believe that the district court was you know, rather careful in this case, and I think this is a careful judge. And, and, and isn't it reasonable, say, for that judge to you know, look at the front and say, well, look, uh, he's already had notice. He got it from the other side, so I don't think I have to give another notice. Why is that not sufficient? Why is that a, a reasonable thing for the district court to, to conclude? There, there are two reasons, Your Honor. The first is uh, because the, the notice ought to come from the district court and not the moving party. And in that respect, the areola decision. Why is that? Because, yeah. Why? There are several reasons. Uh, the interest of judicial economy, for example. Uh, if the... Uh, the if, if the defendant gives a, gives a notice, uh, what's uneconomic about that? Several, Your Honor. First, the notice is more trustworthy coming from the, from the court rather than from the opponent, and, and particularly in these Section 1983 cases, we're dealing with, with litigants who are inherently distrusting of their adversary. For that reason, for the notice to come from the court, it carries a greater uh, imprimatur of, of legitimacy and gravity, whereas... That's, that's fairly subtle, though, isn't it? Uh, I mean, the rules themselves uh, come from the government. Uh, the government provides the court he's going to. The government appoints the judge he's going to. Uh, there's government all over this thing. Well, th that's just one reason, Your Honor, and, and, there, are and there are several others, others as well. Rule 1 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure also states that that places an affirmative duty on the district court to administer the rules, the federal rules, including Rule 56, in a manner uh, that secures the just, speedy, and inexpensive determination what, what, of evidence. You Rule 1 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, which regulate conduct of the district court. What's the statutory or rules authority for this court to impose a rule like Klingeli? 
Your Honor, it's, there are several. It, 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 the authority flows. It, the, the fair notice rule is read, uh, stems from Rule 1 and read in light of Rule 56. Uh, and actually, several, several other circuits have held that the rule is implicit in Rule 56 itself. But, but there's, a whole, there's a whole statutory and, and rule-based system for amending and providing uh, additions to the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. Why isn't this a proper task for that committee, for the Supreme Court, and for Congress? rather than this court to uh, simply impose what is effectively an amendment to the federal rules. And f first, Your Honor, there, there, are, there are procedural due process concerns as well, but before I turn to those, because I'm not, I don't believe that the court needs to reach the con constitutional considerations in this case, Federal Rule of Appellate Procedure 47B, for example, um, gives the Ninth Circuit the authority to regulate practice in a particular case uh, in any manner consistent with federal Law. These but Klingeli didn't say that. You know, what klingeli has been read to do is to regulate practice in all cases involving incarcerated pro se's. So we went a little beyond Rule 47, didn't we? <laughs> Klingeli, the, the rule in Klingeli, Your Honor, is, derives from an, under, an understand, uh, let me step back. The rule in Klingeli is based on the fairness considerations uh, and the notice considerations that, that I believe are inherent in Rule 56 itself. There is a 10-day uh, notice period, for example, in Rule 56. Now that notice period evinces some intent on the part of the drafters of the rule to give a meaningful opportunity for an inmate, uh, pardon me, for a, to, a meaningful opportunity for a litigant uh, to respond to a summary judgment motion. So I read in light of the affirmative duties uh, place on the courts in, in Rule 1, I don't believe that it, it, it's in, somehow an entrenchment on, on the rulemaking authority of the Judicial Council to, to read into the notice provisions of Rule 56 uh, something more substantial when you're dealing with a very unique, limited set of, of litigants who can't be expected to understand. District courts have authority under, under, the, under the rules to uh, adopt local rules. Uh, why isn't this a question for, for a local rule? Aren't we effectively adopting adopted a circuit-wide -wide local rule by imposing a Klingeli requirement? There, there is no reason that the district courts can't adopt a local rule to 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 enforce these kinds of considerations, uh, and in fact, uh, that may be good practice. But beyond that, the duty of the district court stems from Rule One. The, the Rule One places a mandatory duty on the district courts. Council, council we, we all know that Rule 1 doesn't say anything directly about Clint Gelly. It's a remote inference you're trying to draw. Uh, I'm wondering why the clerk of the district court couldn't satisfy the Clint Gelly rule by sending a Xerox of Rule 56. Uh, if she could not, then I'm wondering whether the Clint Gelly rule as you urge, it necessarily invites us into a morass of evaluating, evaluating the adequacy of one notice or another. Or if we formulate a notice, I don't see why we're not violating 28 U.S.C. Section 2072, which says the Supreme Court, not us, can make rules for the district courts. Moreover, I don't see why your inference from Rule 1 doesn't violate 28 U.S.C. 1915A. What Congress did in 1915A is make it harder for prisoners to get to first base, limit the rights of prisoners, require district courts to throw their cases out before there's even an answer, before there's even a motion to dismiss. And it didn't say prisoners get an education first on how to write complaints. Uh, it seems um, inconsistent to say that a prisoner is not entitled to get educated on how to draft a good complaint before he gets it thrown out under 28 U.S.C. 1915A, but he is entitled to get a legal education from the district court clerk before he gets his case thrown out on, on Rule 56. I, I can't see any inference in your chain. Several things, Your Honor. First, the district, uh, the court in this case determined that my client's complaint was not frivolous. So to the extent that the court is concerned about frivolous cases, 
Uh, no, no, that's not the point. The point is Fair Congress enough. is trying to make it harder for prisoners to clutter up the courts with um, non-meritorious lawsuits. Most prisoner cases are non-meritorious. But the ones that are meritorious, a lot are fee generating and they don't need this at all. A friend of mine just won $2 million for a prisoner in a slip and fall. Uh, it's, uh, you're talking about the tiny percentage of prisoner cases that are non-fee generating but are meritorious. And Congress seems to have um, been trying to make it uh, harder for prisoners to get in the door. Well, th that, that's very true, Your Honor. But in fact, the, the, uh, the possibility of a well, You know, we made it harder for prisoners to get through the door, and we're going to have to revise the entire uh, federal judicial system. We're going to have to get rid of our magistrates. We're going to have to get rid of uh, a lot of supporting personnel. And uh, uh, so we need to think about that as well. I, I don't really subscribe to the idea that all the prisoner petitions are, uh, are frivolous. I think many of them serve a good social purpose, and they call attention to the court as to what's actually going on in the, in the prison system. And I think the rule that uh, we have here in the Finkelman case is certainly a, a fair rule. It's a decent rule. <coughs> I think it helps the administration of the district courts when the courts aren't left with a lot of uh, summary judgment motions that. Uh, that don't comply with the rules. So it's just a minor matter to uh, take care of. Our court does it all the time. We pass out a do-it-yourself kit to all people who file a notice of appeal here. And uh, part of our job is to educate. I would agree with your, th that, Your Honor, and I would also add th that today. We've been beaten up kind of this morning. <laughs> I just wanted to know that we don't, we don't all agree with, uh, <laughs> with a lot of the implications of the question. Why shouldn't we have a harmless error exception? There, there's, there are a number of reasons why a harmless error uh, rule would be inappropriate, Your Honor. Uh, one, of, one of the biggest, uh, most important reasons is simply that we'll never be able to apply it in any meaningful or accurate kind of way because never? of- I have a case pending before me right now where the prisoner said, you didn't give me my Klingeli rights, ha ha. In, in a case such as that, Your Honor, uh, if there was a notice violation, it would be very difficult, virtually impossible, for a reviewing court to determine what was left out of the record. I mean, the nature of the violation here is such that, uh, if, accepting for a moment the premises of the rule, which is that certain kinds of litigants, pro se prisoners, uh, uh, don't have an intuitive understanding of the process. Why is there a problem? Why isn't the purpose of the notice well served, indeed entirely served, if the prisoner in fact files affidavits? Several reasons, Your Honor, because the, the mere fact of filing a responsive affidavit or a legal memorandum or any other responsive affidavit, for example, isn't necessarily conclusive evidence on appeal that the well, prisoner understood. All right, but then it comes back to where I started. Then don't you have to go and explain how you actually substantively overcome a motion for summary judgment? Because the notice is only to tell somebody they're going to lose unless they file affidavits. That's right, Your Honor. It, there, there, but it's our position that there are only certain minimal requirements of notice. First, the importance of filing responsive affidavits, because if they don't file responsive affidavits, they need but to be advised. But my hypothesis is that they do. That's right. However, if they're not given adequate notice, we can't infer on appeal that they necessarily understood that they had to produce all of their available evidence. Why can't, you, why can't you look at what they filed and tell whether they understood what was going on or not. You're saying you can never look at what they said, did, and filed and determine it was harmless error? It, Ever? It's a very, uh, yes, Your Honor, it's a very unreliable method for determining whether or not there was prejudice. Prejudice ought to be presumed we, because the record- We do that all the time in hundreds of other situations, though, don't we? Mm -hmm. Why is this so different from the other situations in which we examine something for harmless error? Because this is a very different kind of violation, Your Honor. The record is presumptively incomplete in a situation such as this, where a prisoner isn't expressly notified that if he doesn't put on all of his evidence to counter the evidence put on by the moving party. Where does that presumption, presumption come from? That the, 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 the record is presumptively incomplete? Right. Because if you accept, if you accept for a moment the premises to have the rule in the first place. Okay, so it's circular. 
If you have the rule and they don't follow, presumably uh, the record's incomplete. But if you don't start with, with Klingeli, then what's the presumption of inadequacy of the record? The, the inadequacy of the record follows from the fact that the prisoner didn't have an opportunity to put all of his evidence before the court. Opportunity? Uh, we had every and opportunity it, in the world, presumably. Didn't have an opportunity only because he didn't understand the nature and potential stakes of the summary judgment motion. So when you've got a violation and you ask on appeal, what else could he have done? It's an unfair question because we, we've only got a limited record and courts, courts of appeal when assessing the facts, uh, it can lead to some very murky distinct uh, line drawing, for example, and trying to decide on any given record whether a, whether a particular litigant understood or didn't understand what exactly was required what, of him. What's the justification for drawing the line at incarcerated prisoners? In other words, uh, let's assume your client gets out in the next year or two and he ends up in a small town in, in Alaska. Uh, what are his access, how do, what are, is he going to have for access to legal materials, uh, legal assistance, and so on? Is, aren't a lot of in, impecunious pro se's worse off than incarcerated prisoners? Well, I'm not sure I would, would, would agree with that, that characterization necessarily, but there are some very good reasons to limit it to, to pro se prisoners. The, the, they, they, they do have limited access to legal materials, but it's an involuntary choice. The, uh, the individual... What's an involuntary choice? Pardon me? What's an involuntary choice? The restrictions placed, uh, the, the, in, the uh, litigants' access to legal materials or a lawyer because of the restrictions placed on them by their incarceration. They have very limited access to law libraries in, in, the, prison, in, the, prison, uh, in the prison system. But they're guaranteed that, some access. Minimal access, Your Honor, that's right, true. And that's more than a, an impecunious pro <coughs> in the outside world is guaranteed, isn't that right? That may be true, but in the case of the individual who, who uh, lives in a remote area, that, that individual can, has, has the freedom to contact a lawyer, to contact people outside of their community. But no money. Uh, <coughs> money is a very real limit. That's right. Almost like prison walls on access to legal services. You, That's you right, know, an indigency act. You know that, uh, that uh, I know at least one state in the Ninth Circuit that has done away with law records. Well, that, and that's a very real uh, concern, Your Honor, because in fact, uh, although Prison. that's right, because although the Constitution holds out a certain promise of access to law libraries, what happens in practice is a very different thing. But there's also another reason why it's the, the rule ought to be restricted to prisoners, and that is because prisoners are are, are convicted uh, convicted individuals. They've been through the criminal justice system, unlike. An ordinary pro se civil litigant, for example, an incarcerated individual has, for the most part, their only acquaintance with the court system is with the criminal system, and there is no there is no summary judgment uh, process in the in the in the uh, criminal system, and so. Counsel, so their counsel, under your rule of no prejudice, many of your arguments really go to the possibility of prejudice, but the rule you want is that prejudice doesn't matter. Now. I don't see how it's possible for us to have such a rule in the face of Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 61, harmless error. It says the court at every stage of the proceeding must disregard any error or defect which does not affect the substantial rights of the parties. Also, I don't see how your argument can make practical sense. Let's say you have an incarcerated prisoner who's a lawyer suppose one of these fellows in San Diego that got convicted in that insurance scam knows all about summary judgment. He's been filing motions and oppositions to summary judgment for 20 years. He's pro se. Uh, the opposing counsel gives him a copy of Rule 56 just in case he finds it inconvenient to walk down the hall, go to the library. Uh, under your rule, he's entitled to a reversal. Well, that's right. And I can't see why that makes any sense and how it can be consistent with Rule 61. Counsel, why don't you answer that question, and I think you'll probably want to save some time. You've got about three minutes left. Point Thank you, Your Honor. Oh. Uh, first of all, the, uh, the former lawyer who's, who's behind bars is a very different case from this case. Uh, but uh, in the interest of judicial economy and the courts of appeal being burdened with a number of different 
with, with hundreds of cases where they've got to engage in line drawing as to whether or not this particular litigant knew what was going on or this particular litigant did not, a bright line rule is far more efficient, both in the courts of appeal when assessing whether or not there was prejudice, and secondly, uh, a bright line rule saying it ought to come from the district court below. Uh, but this record does show prejudice. My client withheld expert evidence, and I think that based on that record, it's very difficult to conclude that the mere fact of his filing opposition papers somehow mitigated the effect of any violation. He also d didn't, uh, didn't file his own affidavit. And in light of that, I, I question whether he had any meaningful understanding of, of what was uh, required of him. It's also improvident to go outside the record and ask what else could he have put on, um, on appeal. Well, uh, that's, when they say he didn't file the expert evidence or whatever he had, how do we know that if he didn't file it? Your Honor, they're, they're, uh, in a pretrial in a pretrial statement that my client filed three weeks after he filed his opposition papers, he disclosed the identity of, a, of an expert witness that he intended to call at trial. Uh, six months before he filed his opposition papers, he alluded to uh, the need for expert testimony uh, as well as to some of the medical claims. Uh, and, uh, and he also referred to the need for expert testimony in his, in his uh, motion for appointed counsel, and that's at uh, excerpts of record 69. Uh, so we know that he, kn he had a sense that he needed expert testimony, and we know from the record that it didn't come in on summary judgment. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, a rule requiring uh, a litigant to demonstrate prejudice uh, would, uh, would involve the courts of appeal in these difficult kinds of line drawing uh, situations. Here there's, there's affirmative evidence that my client was prejudiced, but if the court adopts a bright line rule, it will never have to make uh, these kinds of difficult, difficult uh, determinations. And, uh, and finally, if the court is inclined to adopt a rule of prejudice that says, well, what else could he have put on, as, as, the, as the opposition suggests, I'd urge the court not to, to adopt that kind of rule. Uh, the, uh, that would require the courts of appeal to pass on the legal significance of facts that were never in front of the district court to begin with, and particular in, particularly in these kinds of cases where constitutional issues are at stake. Uh, it would be rendering an advisory opinion uh, of, of the worst sort. Uh, and we don't inquire into uh, what other kinds of evidence could come on in other contexts, like granting leave to amend. Uh, and I see my time is up, and I'd like to reserve four minutes for rebuttal, please. All right, we'll give you a couple minutes to respond. <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Court. I'm Kenneth Baumgarten. I'm the Deputy Attorney General with um, the California Department of Justice, and I represent the defendants in this case. <clears throat> and I was also the counsel that um, handled the underlying motion for summary judgment in this case um, several years back. I think in discussions regarding the rights of Mr. Rand, um, a state prisoner, that we not lose sight of the fact that in this case there's also 10 defendants in this case that have lived with this case for nine years now and had it hanging over their heads as far as disposition <clears throat> and included with, the, uh, with that threat of, of constant litigation is the constant threat of potential liability, financial liability to each one of them until this case is finally resolved. Now I would indicate, or I, I would contend, that in this case it, it is it's a classic case for application of a harmless error rule to the Klingali um, uh, decision. In, uh, are you asking us to oust Klingali in its entirety, or do you accept Klingali and are asking us to write a harmless error exception into it? The latter, Your Honor, because I think Klingali was, was very well reasoned in, in the areola. The cases that followed that are all well reasoned, and they have certain applications in, in prison litigation. However, in the 10 years that I've been doing civil rights litigation such as this, it's, it's not often that district courts neglect to, to follow procedural rules, especially with respect to pro per prisoner inmates and the like. And there's actually an, an effort to bend over backwards to ensure that all of their it's rights to the are guaranteed. Courts, it's, a, it's to the district court's benefit to educate the, uh, the prisoner so that when the papers come in, they're in order, and they don't have to fret over them and worry. So 
it serves a beneficial purpose. Absolutely, Your Honor, and I certainly don't dispute that at all. And that's usually the case with the um, in in the ten years the, that I've been doing this. Courts have routinely um, provided this notice. The, the courts do routinely provide this notice, and and we went through a transition period, as I argued during the first Ninth Circuit argument in this case that that there was some confusion with the district courts as to who had the obligation to provide this notice. For that very reason, my office and, and, and myself in particular, we, we took, undertook the responsibility to, to, as a safeguard, provide the two and a half pages of notice that was provided in this particular case that was actually patterned after some of the notice that was given by the district court routinely in other cases. And it was, a, it was a check and a balance and a safeguard to ensure that the inmate did receive notice of Clean Galley. He was specifically cited to Clean Galley in this case. And the two and a half pages of the notice here is not necessarily legalese. It cites some very important cases that have, that, that have precedential value in summary judgment motions, civil rights litigations, the burdens of, of proof for the various um, parties to the litigation. Counsel, are, are you saying that this, because this is an old case and was in a transition period, that the district court at that point weren't clear about the need to apply Klingeli and therefore you were making sure that the notice was given, but that we are now through the transition period and that the district courts now understand and do provide the Klingeli notice? In the Eastern District, in the cases that I'm familiar, familiar with, Your Honor, that is true. They, they actually give this notice quite early in the litigation rather than later on or in response to a motion. And they're not having any difficulty in applying that Klingeli rule in the, in the district you practice in? Um, I, I have not seen that difficulty, Your Honor. Counsel, what do we need a Klingeli rule for then? I, I'm nonplussed by your suggestion that we keep it but uh, not apply it where there's no prejudice. I don't see where we get authority to impose it. It seems to me perfectly clear that district courts and opposing counsel are going to educate pro se's, especially district courts, to the extent they can because it makes the cases so much easier to handle. And I don't see where our Klingeli rule does anything to add to that that's within our authority. So on what basis do you think we should keep it? Well, I, I don't think it would be prudent to overturn it because it's very well reasoned, along with the other cases that have cited that since that time. Um, but I, I think, as Justice O'Scanlan pointed out in, the, 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 in a concurring opinion, that, that it, it seems strange that pro per prisoners are provided this special right in civil rights litigation that, that the ordinary citizen on the street, who may not have the same access to law libraries that prisoners certainly have, and, and the up-to-date law libraries, and, and certainly um, many prisoners have nothing better to do than to spend the time in the law library. Do you think we should extend it to the non-prisoners as well? No, I, I, I don't believe, um, well, I believe that the, the responsibility should be on the court to ensure that litigants before it understand the, the rights that, that they have, their responsibilities procedurally. And, and I think the courts, both at this level and at the district court level, do everything they can to ensure that. But I, I think we have an inherent in fairness, unfairness here, and especially a due process and equal protection issue possibly to the defendants in this case, because they had no control over what the, the district court did or did not do. However, my office, and me in particular, in, 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 in recognizing the need to apprise a pro se in, in, inmate of his responsibilities under Rule 56, undertook to give that notice. But now we're faced with a technical error by a district court nine years after the fact, and I have 10 defendants here that are facing a, a lengthy trial or possible lengthy litigation in a case that's very old. I, I think that there's fundamental unfairness here at this point, especially in light of the trial court record in this case that shows, that demonstrates that Mr. Rand was a very sophisticated jailhouse lawyer um, where he spent his deposition clearly indicates that he spent considerable time in the law library. He had this case drafted, the, the complaint in this case drafted before he even left the 180-day confinement in the infirmary at, at Tehachapi, before he even arrived at the California Medical Facility. He was ready to file this case within, a, and he did, within 30 days of his arrival of, of the California Medical Facility. The man knows what he was doing. When I filed my motion for summary judgment, he filed a 139-page opposition to my motion for summary judgment. 
and uh, attached to that were exhibits A through M, plus another section of miscellaneous exhibits. The man, and, and he included declarations from other inmates, he included C, uh, Department of Correction policies and procedures for HIV treatment, he included responses, discovery responses from the defendants in this case. The man clearly knew what his responsibility Your were. opponent says, however, that he didn't because he had expert testimony at hand and didn't include it, and that shows that he didn't understand that he had to include it. Do you have any response? To I, I do, Your Honor. In, in particular, the pretrial statement that, um, that, that counsel refers to is a 19-page document that, that uh, Mr. Rand very eloquently provided to the court and provided all of his trial witnesses, including the name of a physician. But I have to query at this point if, if he was faced with a motion for summary judgment and knew what his obligations were and undertook to file such a lengthy opposition, why didn't he ask for additional time to get a declaration from that doctor who was so crucial to, to his case? He didn't do that. On the other hand, my summary judgment motion was supported by a declaration from his treating physician at the California Medical Facility his treating physician that undertook to treat him for his HIV condition and showed that the man had no medical harm. None of the medical allegations in this case were true. And none of the other conditions of confinement allegations were true in this case. This is the record that the district court was faced with. We had a case that the plaintiff was completely unable to factually rebut all of the evidence that was put in. Counsel, against take, take the ordinary case. If we adopt the rule uh, for a harmless error, Take the ordinary case with a defendant who's, or a plaintiff who's not as sophisticated as the individual you describe, who doesn't receive the proper Congelli notice. How are we to determine whether he omitted things that he might have included uh, had he received the proper notice? How can we apply a harmless error test when what we're looking at is what's not in the record? <coughs> Well, I, I, would, I would cite the court and I would respond to you, Your Honor, about how the other circuits, in particular the Seventh Circuit, the Second Circuit, the District of Columbia Circuit, how they handle that same analysis. They look to whether or not there's been any prejudice in the record to the plaintiff and, and whether or not there is any legitimate evidence to show that the person would have done something different had he received the notice under Kling Galley uh, in, in this circuit. But as, as it's been pointed out today and previously in the, in the underlying opinion, is that Rule 56 doesn't require this type of special notice to litigants. You also have the, the situation, as you do here, often in prisoner litigation, you have a report and recommendation from a magistrate. And it tells them, look, you need to uh, file objections with the district court, and if you don't, you can lose your right of appeal. And like this one says, I recommend this case be dismissed in its entirety. Correct. Now, if Mr. Rand thought he was about to lose his case for failure to present something, that magistrate's report told him everything he needed to know to get back in there and do something, didn't it? I agree with you, Your Honor, and I would also add to the fact that in addition to the notice I provided him on my motion for summary judgment, there were two findings and recommendations in this case, as the court record indicates. The first findings and recommendations also included the summary judgment standards under which the district court or the magistrate judge was deciding this case under. That provided a second form of notice to Mr. Rand as to what his obligations were to rebut summary judgment. The second findings and recommendations that were issued in November of 1994 set forth again the summary judgment standards and a notice to the plaintiff or an acknowledgement that the defendants had already provided the required clean galley notice. So the def this plaintiff had three different types of notices before the district court judge Levy ultimately dismissed this case in its entirety. And he had the opportunity, and he did file objections to the first set of findings and recommendations. So we have a plaintiff here that not only was knowledgeable enough to file an opposition to my motion for summary judgment, one quite extensive and, and, and as competently done as some lawyers I have seen in, in the past as far as their attention to detail, and, and he struggled to get as much information and evidence that he could. But he also filed objections to the first set of findings and recommendations, indicating that he had a knowledge that, that I'm going to lose this case if I don't come up with something and present it to the court. Mr. Baumgartner, but, but, but let me get back to this prejudice point about, I'm not sure that shows that he fully understood what he had to do. Uh, how do you respond to uh, your opponent's uh, point about the fact that he, at some point, uh, 
indicated that he had expert testimony he could present. Well, my, my response is, is, as I indicated earlier, Your Honor, is that, that there's nothing that precluded Mr. Rand from supplying a declaration. Well, it's, not, it's not a matter of preclusion. It's a matter of getting notice that he had to present it at that time. Well, his notice would be in the form of my motion for summary judgment that was supported by a declaration from his own treating physician. Was the expert really ready to go to bat for him? Mr. Rand's expert? I don't have a clue, Your Honor. Isn't that the point? And the reason you don't? The you never opportunity saw? was there, I'm sorry, but the opportunity was there for Mr. Rand, as he had done a number of times in this case, to request an extension of time from the district court, saying, I have additional evidence to pre uh, present. I have an expert witness that I would like to submit a declaration. Well, it's not a matter of opportunity. It's a matter of notice. What I'm concerned with is, uh, in other words, you know, uh, how, how, are we, how do we determine whether or not there was prejudice? I suppose it is true that he had this expert that he could present, but he didn't know he had to present at this time. I, I, I mean, what indicates, uh, what in the record indicates that he had noticed that he had to present that affidavit at that time? At that time, meaning in opposition to your motion for summary judgment. And he failed to do that? Well, apparently he did. Well, he did fail to do that, but I mean, he, he was on notice. The, the, the notice that I provided him indicates that affidavits and, um, well, all the document, all the information that's listed on page three. Counsel, I think the problem is there are two separate points. One is, is there a violation? And two, if there is, is it harmless? And when Judge Tashima asks you and, and others have asked, you know, uh, how do you tell whether it's harmless? Your answer always is, well, there was no violation. If there's no violation, if you've given him all the notice, then of course it, the, he, there's an, the, the, he had an obligation to provide it. But in a case in which he wasn't given the notice, in a case in which there is a violation, how does the court determine whether it was harmless, whether he failed to put into the record material that he actually had? Well, I, I believe that would be a de novo review of the trial court record at that point to see what the plaintiff actually did or did not do. But Is the person trying to get a we case reversed? We don't know reversed? what it would have done if he had had notice. How do we know from a record no. that doesn't contain information because he wasn't notified that he had to provide that information? Maybe when there he says, be, you didn't give me my Klingeli notice. Doesn't a, doesn't a person trying to get an appellate court to reverse a trial court for error usually have the burden of showing that some harm was uh, are done? Are you incapable of answering <laughs> that question, counsel? Would you like to find to answer it for you? Um, there are only about five questions pending. There, there are. I, I, and, 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 and it's my turn. Counsel did a, an excellent job fending that off. Um, I, I would indicate that, that it, the plaintiff does have the burden at the appellate court level to show that there was some prejudice or, notice, or indicate in the record where that prejudice might, may, might lie. But I think it's important in, in this Rand v. Rowland case to lo go back to the pro per appellate brief initially filed in this case, wh which does not indicate that Mr. Rand ever thought that he was prejudiced in any way about having an inab inability to present evidence in, in his case. He never raised this Klingali issue in his pro per appellate brief. He never cited it as error. He never made any legal contentions that he, he had additional evidence to present and was not allowed to or did not know that he could do that. He only challenged the legal analysis of the magistrate judge in this case that ultimately recommended dismissal of the case. Well, you see, but again, see, that assumes that he had sufficient notice as to what he should do. Maybe there's a better way to state the rule you want, although in your brief, you stated in terms of prejudice, maybe the rule you're contending for that notice either from the court or from opposing counsel is sufficient. Isn't that sort of the rule you're contending for? Yes, Your Honor. Because uh, whichever one it comes from, notice is notice. And well, he has this, assuming the substance of your notice is sufficient. Isn't that what you're contending for? That's correct. And, you don't, and, and if that's correct, it's almost the other side of what Judge, Judge Reinhardt's saying, then he had notice and you don't have to search for whether or not you know, there was prejudice. Is that, is that a fair, fair statement of your position? Yes, yes it is, Your Honor. I agree with that. Counsel, tell me if there's a Klingeli violation here. What some trial courts like to do, for just the reason Judge Pragerson said, that it makes things fairer and it makes them more efficient, is they give every pro se a booklet, How to Be a Pro Se Litigant, in order to educate the, uh, the person as soon as he files a case without a lawyer on the complaint. Now, is it the Klingeli rule that 
If the court does not then send another paper explaining Rule 56 when a summary judgment motion is made, there's a Klingeli violation. And then the question is whether under the Klingeli rule as our circuit has it, it's a violation and you reverse. Under the rule you want, we then decide whether the booklet that the pro se was given at the beginning of the case would be, would eliminate prejudice. Yes, Your Honor, I agree with that. I think that there would be a technical violation of Klingeli, but if the circuit were to adopt a harmless error evaluation process to where you do look to see whether or not there was any form of notice provided to the litigant about what his or her responsibilities are in the face of a motion for summary judgment, that should lean or go against reversal of an otherwise legitimate summary judgment motion that's been granted and that's supported by the trial court record. So is it your thought then that the Klingeli rule as you contemplated would essentially shift the burden on appeal? In other words, if no Klingeli notice was given in the district court, then it becomes the obligation of the defendant to show there was no prejudice. No, Your Honor, I don't believe that there should be a shifting of the burden at all. I believe that the plaintiff or the appellant should still bear that burden of showing that, hey, I didn't get the notice and I was prejudiced because, and still bears the burden of proof. I had wanted to propose a... But wouldn't it have to appear in the record? In other words, let's assume that the plaintiff goes through the summary judgment process, does not put in the doctor's affidavit, and that's the record we get. Now, how does that appellant show prejudice from the lack of that affidavit when the record is silent? Well, you know, I don't think in all circumstances that that would be prejudice, Your Honor. I mean, I've been to trial numerous times and the day, the week after the trial, thought about something I should or should not have done. But that doesn't mean that I have a right to go back and get a second bite of the apple. It's done. And in a case in civil rights litigation, you file a complaint, you have the burden of proof, and it's much, it's very easy to make these allegations against prison officials and these pro se inmates find it, and also the attorneys that often represent them. It's far more difficult to prove the allegations than it is to make them. So when we get to that stage, and then it's rebutted by admissible evidence by the defendants that there is no constitutional violations at hand, I think that that burden then shifts back to the pro se plaintiff to show that there's been some sort of error. In my example, that pro se could not show prejudice. In other words, if the record got closed with a decision of the district court except in the magistrate's R&R, and he didn't, and the prisoner didn't file a motion for reconsideration, or otherwise put in the record what he would have put in had he had sufficient notice, then he's done on appeal. Yes, I believe that that would be the case, Your Honor. And I think that that would be, that would simplify many of these cases that come up to this court. And again, this is not a routine practice that I have seen. I mean, I'm certainly not in your position, but from what I've seen in the Eastern District, most of these cases come with the admonition from the district court right out of the, right out of the chute. Once these cases come, initial orders are issued for service and summons. Frequently, they're now starting a new process to where they advise them right up front about what all their obligations are. But I still don't think that it hurts for the defense to go ahead and re-admonish the pro se plaintiff as to what his or her obligations are in the face of a motion for summary judgment at that time. Following up on Judge Tashima's point, is it your idea that if the notice that was given by the defendants was adequate and the same kind of notice that would have been given by the district court, that under Klinkelly, that would be harmless error? Under Klinkelly, it should, Your Honor. But under Klinkelly, literally now, it is not harmless error. No, I mean, your argument is that it should be. That we should have some sort of a harmless error evaluation that if the court, the appellate court can look at. Just so I make it clear, is that what you're contending should be the focus of the harmless error is whether the notice was adequate as otherwise given? Correct. And whether it's been done by the district court or by the moving party for summary judgment. What would the situation be if neither the district court nor you gave any notice, the moving party, but yet 
it would appear from the papers filed that the pro se prisoner fully understood what was going on. Would you say that harmless error would be available in that I, type of a situation or not? I, I believe it would because Rule 56 doesn't require this particular special notice to anybody. I, I, don't, I, I don't believe the man or the person on the street who files a civil rights case gets that type of notice. And, and um, one would have to say that, that in reviewing the record, that if, if there has been no notice whatsoever, that's consistent with the Seventh Circuit's position on, on, on looking at the record as a whole to see whether or not there's been any prejudice. Could that plaintiff had, had done something um, differently? But we could always say that they could have done something differently, and I don't believe that that's a fair analysis to the defendant. That's a lot more difficult inquiry, isn't it, than the one we were, that you and I were discussing earlier as to whether the, the, it, the notice given by the defendants is the same sort of notice that would be required by the district court under Klingeli. If you get into the, the latter question of whether could he have done something differently, then we get into all these questions that were raised earlier, and that is, uh, is there an expert that he could have called if he, and that, that sort of thing? Correct. And, and Your Honor, I believe that this harmless error standard, looking for notice from someone, as long as it was given either by the moving party or the district court, suffices and it's a, it's a reasonable compromise to the dilemma that's here today. I mean, sending or the possibility of sending a nine-year-old case back to the trial court for additional work, for additional possibly trial, um, um, is, is inherently unfair to the defendants. When the overwhelming evidence in the trial court record that's up here at this level shows that they were entitled to judgment as a matter of law. And as a practical matter, routinely, the district court in the Eastern District is going to send out this notice along with a packet of other material to uh, the pro pers and others on how to get you summoned <coughs> served by the marshal and all the rest of it. Correct. And, and, and I believe because of the number of cases that have come up under Queen Galley issues that have been sent back to the district court, I mean, people, lessons have been learned and, and, and efforts have been made to correct that. But I think that there's this period, this, this, this time period that we're dealing with in this particular case and others that this court has addressed that deserve some sort of a harmless error um, evaluation to see whether or not the plaintiff in fact was prejudiced by the lack of uh, notice from, from the district court, even though it was given by the moving party. And, and if the answer to that is no, that the record is perfectly clear that Mr. Rand knew what he was doing, he undertook to do <coughs> everything he possibly could within the bounds of what he had available to him. But, uh, so your first argument is, if I understand it, in answer to Judge Hugg, that you don't reach a prejudice argument because he did receive everything he was entitled to receive in the way of notice from the defendant. And therefore, he received all of the notice he was due. That's your basic argument. Yes, that's correct, Your Honor. And there would be and no... And then you don't even have to look to a prejudice. That's correct. You would not have to evaluate the prejudice issue. When you say Seventh Circuit, which case are you referring to? Um, I, I don't have it before me. It was the um, one that, that was cited by Justice O'Scanlan. I don't have it right in front of me, Your Honor. There isn't another circuit that has the rule we do, is there? Not, not that I, I, I believe not. Well, there's uh, no circuit other than the seventh that looks to prejudice. The, six, the, I, the, 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 six, sir, the fifth circuit thought they were adopting our rule when they adopted Jacobson for a prison, but didn't realize that we had Klingel. That's correct. But the other circuits, the D.C. Circuit, 2nd, 4th, 11th, basically follow our rule. Well, they also allow, though, that the moving party can provide the notice in lieu of the district court. So again, that's more or less the harmless error evaluation. Did somebody get Well, no, it's not harmless error. They, they, they say you have to have the notice. Correct. Some of them. Whichever one say you have to have the notice, say it only the 7th Circuit says you can look to prejudice as a result of failure to receive them. That's correct, Your Honor. But under the approach that we just discussed, if, if you look to harmless error that someone gave the notice and require notice from one from either the district court or the moving party, you don't have to reach the prejudice issue. I guess you can look at it uh, uh, two ways. It's a bit of an optical illusion. I, I suppose if, you, if, if there, our rule is that the district court has to give the notice, but the same kind of notice was given by the defendant that the failure of the district court to give that notice under our rule 
would be harmless error. I guess that's what you're saying. Yes, Your Honor. If we were to get into substance rather than the technical form of notice and try to understand whether the prisoner really understood what he was supposed to do, then I guess we would have to deal with the learning disabilities common among prisoners, the difficulty in comprehension. I believe in IQ, their one standard deviation below the rest of the population. Uh, so what we would need to do really is probably give them a film and some question answer, a seminar maybe, and a lot of help. Well, that's a whole area that we probably wouldn't want to get into in, evaluation and due pro in evaluating due process. Um, I mean, because of the provisions of, of the law libraries at the prison, they have adequate access to that legal knowledge. And quite frankly, I mean, I've seen um, motions and pleadings filed on paper bags from the prison. I mean, there is a lot of um, latitude given to pro se inmates as to what they can file in, in court. I saw one written on toilet paper as a gesture of protest. Yeah. I have this, not, I have not this, been served with those yet, Your Honor. This rule of adequate notice to the prisoner of what he has to do in a summary judgment no motion has not proved to be a great problem for the D.C. Circuit, Seventh, Second Circuit, Fourth Circuit, Eleventh Circuit, our circuit. It's not a, a major disruption of the judicial system, nor does it cause tremendous difficulties to Your Honor, I would agree with you, and I don't believe that it's a pervasive problem in this circuit or in the Eastern District or any of the districts here in California. But I, I, for whatever reason, if there's been a technical failure by the district court, that I, I think it's inherently unfair to punish the defendants as well as the per perhaps give something to the plaintiff. Well, let me ask you if I understand your basic position. It's in two ways. One, the defendant should be allowed to fill in whatever deficiency there is in the district court's notice, and that should be treated as adequate notice as if it were given by the district court. And secondly, there's no problem now. You're, you've got a nine-year-old case, which was a transition case, before the district courts understood that they have to give the Klingeli instruction. I, I believe both of those are correct, Your Honor. You're saying that the, uh, the Attorney General would step ahead of the district court? No, I don't mean to suggest that, Your Honor. I, I believe that we were, were taking a... Can uh, someone just boot in that, this particular case? That's correct. And, but I mean, we were... You just covered it by sending basically the same information. We provided what we normally do in these cases. I'm still providing this notice in, in, in motions for summary judgment to this day, regardless of what the district court does, because it certainly can't hurt. Um, and, and, it, and it just shows that, I mean, we're going the extra mile to at least provide that notice to the plaintiff. But, it, but in this case, it was a technical failure of the district court, and, and I just think it's inherently unfair but in, in considering the record in this case, the evidence, if, if the court reviews the, the findings and recommendations of the magistrate judge of November of 94, look at the analysis that was applied to the evidence that was submitted by the defendants. The plaintiff clearly does not have a case here. And to remand a nine-year-old case back in the face of that type of evidence, I think, is inherently unjust to the defendants in this case. And, and I think the harmless error standard, if, if this court would, would consider something to that effect, that would apply. This is a classic case for an application of such a standard. And it can be a very limited rule for, for just these types of cases where there's been a technical failure, inadvertence by the, the, the court, but yet there was an effort by the moving party to at least provide that notice to the, the plaintiff. All right, thank you, thank counsel. You. <clears throat> Would you agree that if the defendant provided accurate information that should have been provided by the district judge and gave, gave the prisoner <clears throat> all of the information he was entitled to, that there would not be a violation? I believe that there, there would be a violation, that the notice is better off coming from the court than from the moving party. Well, no, it's better but, but, it comes from the court. But in this particular case, if, if uh, <coughs> the, the, the moving party's evident, uh, notice in this case was not sufficient because it didn't do two things. It didn't tell my client that he had to put all of his evidence on or else risk losing his right to trial. Uh, and that if he didn't put all of his evidence on, 
uh, the moving party's evidence would be accepted as true. Rule but, can, but counsel, isn't the problem with your argument on that, that if the notice had come from the district court, we probably would have considered it adequate. Wouldn't you agree? Clint Gallian would have been satisfied if the district court had given the precise notice that the prosecution gave in this case. Isn't that so? I don't, I don't think so, Your Honor, because because Klingeli approved the, the Hudson versus Hardy rule, the rule of the D.C. Circuit, and that in, the, in that circuit, as well as others, the Seventh Circuit, uh, the courts have gone on to articulate a broader uh, standard requiring more detailed kinds of information. All and right, the panel's well, let's, let's decision- take your, Let's take your analysis then. Let's assume that uh, the notice that you want to have been given uh, was drafted in clear, concise language apprising your client of what he needed to do. What's wrong with the prosecution giving the notice rather than the court in the limited circumstances the government is talking about in this case. If the notice were, were drafted by the prosecution and contained all of the proper elements, I still, I still believe it ought to come from the district court because of the, of the particular imprimatur that the court can put on it. It also gives the district court an opportunity to review the content of the notice. If, the, if we have a rule that says that, it, that the notice may properly come from the moving party, the court is left out of the equation. Isn't that a little like no saying that Miranda warnings ought to be given by the court? The, uh, it's, it's not, Your Honor, there, there are, the court is, is, is involved with the judicial process, it's involved with, with the consideration of a summary judgment motion, um, unlike the Miranda context, it happens outside the, uh, the courtroom walls, for example, the, the court has no opportunity to give Miranda warnings. Here's the, the same kind of thing, an adversary is giving the warning. But unlike the Miranda context, Your Honor, this kind of notice, it, this is very different because it, 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 the purpose of it is to warn the litigant that he could potentially lose his right to, pers to pursue with his lawsuit, uh, to proceed with his lawsuit. Uh, the Miranda warnings are, are, are different. Uh, this record, leaving aside the question of who ought to supply the record, uh, pardon me, the notice, this record uh, shows that the notice was not adequate. It didn't come from the district court. It didn't come from you the You said in court. two respects. One, it failed to uh, advise him that he had to put on all of the evidence. And what's the second respect? Didn't, didn't advise him, Your Honor, of the consequences of, not, of failing to do that, that he could lose his right to proceed to trial, simply notifying him in the terms of the text of Rule 56, the possibility of summary judgment is not enough, contrary to the lay intuition that, that, that he's going to have a right to go to trial. Counsel, why should you have to commit a crime and go to prison to get this special help if you don't have a lawyer? Why shouldn't a poor person who has a non-fee generating case and appears pro se be able to get all this help without committing a crime and going to prison? Well, I would, I would, uh, I would guess that many of the, the litigants don't commit crimes to, 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 in order to get this kind of notice. But, beyond, but aside from that, the, uh, the ordinary civil litigant who has not been committed of a crime does not have a lay intuition that they are automatically entitled to, to a right to trial that's as, as deeply ingrained as the, as the, cri as the criminal, uh, uh, as the convicted litigant who has been through the criminal court system. And so it's all the more important that these are the types of individuals that get the notice. I see my time is up, if I may briefly be permitted to conclude. The notice in this case was deficient. It was deficient because the district court didn't give it, but even if uh, and the notice supplied by the moving party also was deficient because it didn't contain the requisite elements. These are difficult problems and no single, no single rule can be crafted to solve all of these problems. But it's our position that this circuit should, should, should adhere to the standard articulated by the panel in the interest of judicial efficiency and fairness. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Margolin and uh, Mr. Baumgartner. We, those were uh, fine oral, oral arguments. We appreciate it and uh, we'll be in adjourned. Join us Thanksgiving when our companion network, C-SPAN, will have the dedication ceremony of the George Bush presidential.